Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? This is a program where we are focused all together on the Bible. It is our desire that by means of this program, all of us become better acquainted with this most marvelous, this most important book, this book that was written by God himself. And we just can't spend enough time in the Bible. We never can learn all that there is to be learned from the Bible either. But on this program, as we as we talk together uh, about various questions that we might have in our minds, we try to relate those questions to the Bible and thereby learn more and more from the Bible as well as get a greater appreciation of the importance of the Bible, get a better, uh, greater appreciation of what all is in the Bible because the Bible has a lot of information that you and I ought to know about, given the fact that God has addressed the Bible to you and to me. We want to know all we can, therefore, from the Bible. And so this program is dedicated to focusing on the Bible. Now, we get... Uh, uh, we can't. We have people who listen to the open forum program in many other countries. They can't call in on this program, so they write in. And we have a, a, a caller here or a listener in Nigeria, in Africa, and he's asking about the sin against the Holy Spirit, which from which we cannot be forgiven. And he's wondering if that relates to the mortal sin spoken of in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16 and 17 in the Bible. In that passage of 1 John, God says that there is a sin that cannot be forgiven. Uh, and and uh, in uh, uh, Mark chapter 3, God describes that sin as blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And when we study the Bible carefully, we find that that was a very very unique sin, namely that uh, it is a sin whereby anybody who has, uh, who believes in their heart that Jesus was under the power of Satan rather than under the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, that uh, they, that such a person will have uh, gone beyond the possibility of forgiveness. Now, bear in mind that that such a person would never, never, never worry about this. They, because they don't, they would be convinced that Jesus was of the devil, and therefore they haven't the slightest desire that he might be their savior. Uh, so, it, uh, uh, if anyone had come to that point in their life, and they truly uh, never would want Christ as their savior because they believe Christ was of the devil. They would have committed a mortal sin, that is, a sin for which there is no forgiveness. Now, incidentally, every sin is mortal. That is, every sin brings death. But the wonderful thing is that any sin, except for this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, can be forgiven if Christ becomes our Savior. It is true that today there is an arena, there is a place in the world that is, uh, that is uh, in a most remarkable and impossible place that is in the local congregations where there is no forgiveness because the Holy Spirit must do the forgiving and the Holy Spirit is not operating there. And so uh, we are living in dangerous times today, far more dangerous than ever uh, uh, during the last couple of thousand years because uh, during the last couple of thousand years uh, the Holy Spirit operated in the churches of course and also in in the world itself but uh, but today no we have to be outside of the local congregations if we are going to be forgiven and so it is a very very unique and and as I say dangerous time because all kinds of people are convinced are convinced 
that they are safe and secure because they are a fine uh, uh, member, a faithful member of a local congregation. And uh, they are not listening to the Bible. They're listening to their uh, church elders or their church pastor. They're listening to what they have been taught and not what the, the Bible is saying. Well, thank you, Nigeria, for that provocative question. And now shall we take our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Hello. Uh, for the campaign? Yes. I have two questions I want to ask you. Yes. Uh, you're talking about the church ages um, over, right? Yes. Okay, like four of us brothers know about the Bible. Can we have a street meeting and invite people to come to hear the Word of God from village to village? Can I, I, I'm sorry, what about going from village to village? Now, we're not going to have a church with no minister. Yeah. We're just going to have service like village to village, like, well, you know, in the street. It, you see, I... Uh, yes, you, uh, we have to define church. The local congregation is not just a group of people meeting together. It is, a, it is designed by God himself. It is a divine, it has been a divine institution that God himself gave the rules for. There were to be elders and deacons who have the spiritual oversight over the congregation those who attended were to be under the authority of these elders and deacons, so there had to be a membership so that their, that authority could be there. Uh, there were two ceremonial laws, namely water baptism and the Lord's table, that were to be observed under the care and guidance of the elders and deacons or the and the pastor, and and that constitute or that was what the local congregation is. Now, if a group of people come together, there is no membership. There is a teaching of the Word of God. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, no elders. There are no deacons. There's nobody who has the spiritual authority over others. Yes, that is possible today, that is, but that is not a, a local congregation. That is just a group of people meeting together. Okay. How about, um, uh, a man was asked in the Bible, um, how, you know, how he can be saved. And I think the pastor tells us to repent. How can a man repent if the Holy Spirit is not uh, given a repentant spirit? Can he well, see, repent? That, that is the problem. First of all, the Bible commands us to repent, and nobody can repent of themselves because above ourselves we are in rebellion against God we we uh, may think we're repenting but uh, 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 the fact is the Bible tells us we are spiritually dead we're spiritually dead uh, and the only way that we truly repent is because God has given us a brand new resurrected soul in which we never want to sin again so that repentance becomes a part of our life but that is the equivalent of having become saved so when God commands us to repent he's really commanding us to become saved and we and we know that we have to wait upon God he is the only one who can save us he 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 gave you the repentance spirit that you could call upon him right I'm sorry he gave you a repentant spirit that you can call upon him. Can ordinary you no, cannot do that. No, he did not give us just a repentant spirit. He made us a new child, a child of God. He gave us a brand new soul, in which we, you see, before we are saved, in our soul or spirit essence as well as in our body, we are in rebellion against God. Even though we think we are trying to do the will of God. Uh, we're trying to do it on our own, uh, on our own uh, plan, uh, or our own way, and so effectively we are still in rebellion. But when we become saved, that God, as a part of the salvation program, God gives us a new, a brand new resurrected soul, and His Spirit indwells us. And the consequence of that is now we are repenting because. 
we don't want to do the sins any longer that we had been doing before. We have a real ongoing desire to do the will of God. So when God commands us to repent, like when he tells us to believe, or when he tells us to seek him, or when he tells us to uh, do whatever, we know that, that we'll only do these things properly when God has saved us. And that is why the Bible says, no man can come to me except the Father draw him. God has to do all the saving. Okay, thank, thank you. you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi, Mr. Camping. Yes. Uh, a couple weeks ago on the uh, Bible class of the air, in the middle of one of your uh, topics, you made kind of an isolated statement, uh, something to the effect of uh, how uh, when God the Holy Spirit gives uh, a particular family up, it can cause the destruction of the family. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that. The fact is, uh, uh, if God the Holy Spirit is not uh, uh, in a person's life, they are on a path of destruction. Because uh, if God is, does not indwell us, then we're still not saved. We're still under the wrath of God. And the final outcome of this, unless we do become saved, is eternal damnation. Well, I was just wondering if um, a wife is uh, planning on divorcing her husband, uh, if God ever had anything to do with that in terms of uh, giving up that family. Oh, no, I don't, no, that's just, we, we don't understand that. We, uh, at least uh, that, uh, the Bible doesn't focus on that. If, a, if a, you could have a child of God who loves the Lord dearly, who's married to an unsaved spouse, and that unsaved spouse, husband or wife, uh, wants to go their own way and seek a divorce, and the Bible certainly allows for that possibility. But that doesn't mean now that God has given up that family. It just means that there are uh, there are there's an individual in that family who's not saved, and that doesn't mean either that that person might not become saved at some later time. Uh, we we uh, as long as there's life, there's still a hope of salvation. I understand that that would be your position, and I thank you. I was just an isolated statement that I may have misunderstood. Thank you, Mr. Campbell. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes, good evening. Yes, I just wanted to ask about the baptism. Doesn't that have some value still? Uh, water baptism has uh, never had any spiritual value. It was a teaching, uh, teaching uh, tool that God had given, just like water, ba just like a uh, burnt offering in the Old Testament. It had no spiritual value, but it was a sign pointing to the fact that they needed uh, Christ as their burnt offering to pay for their sins. And water baptism is a sign, a teaching method to teach us that even as water washes away the the uh, dirt from our skin so uh, we need the washing of the word of god to wash away our sins and so it has but it's never had any any uh, uh, spiritual value although uh, i admit the local congregations historically the pastors and so on have put an enormous amount of uh, spiritual content into water baptism that never did exist uh, they uh, they have taught that uh, there are churches who teach that if you have been baptized in water that guarantees your salvation or it initiates your salvation or it brings you into a particular uh, covenant relationship of some kind that almost virtually guarantees salvation uh, they have put all kinds of spiritual content into that act that never existed because you can be baptized in water uh, in uh, ten different ways uh, and uh, that won't get you one smidgen, one, uh, one uh, inch closer to salvation. We, you have to have your sins washed away and only God can do that. 
Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello? Yes, good evening. Yes, um, I'm self-righteous, but I don't know how I should pray to God about it. I'm sorry, you're self-righteous? Yes. Well, what you mean uh, you're trying to trust in your good works in order to get right with God? Is that your idea? I think maybe subconsciously. Yeah, well, the fact is that, you know, the Bible, it, this is so wonderful. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, God says, Don't be anxious about anything, but with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. All right, if you believe that you are having trouble, uh, you're, you find that you are really trusting in your good, good works and, and trusting that somehow that's making you look good to God and somehow that's going to get you saved, tell God about it. Go to Him. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. I, I, I'm, I'm, I know I'm trusting in my good works and I know that that's, there are filthy rags in your sight. Uh, oh, Lord, uh, may it be that I am trusting only in the Lord Jesus, and I know that apart from the Lord Jesus paying for my sins, no matter how righteous I become, I will still end up under the wrath of God. I would suggest also you read Ezekiel chapter 33, and also James, Ezekiel 33 it talks there about if a righteous man commits one sin, all of his righteousness will not help him at all. Uh, and uh, he is still under the wrath of God. And in James chapter 2, verse, uh, in James chapter 2, in verse uh, 10, in verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And so you just start reflecting on that. Now, I certainly am not perfect, and therefore I am as guilty before God as if I have committed every sin in the book. And so now, what uh, all my good works, where is that going to take me? How, how's that going to benefit me? Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, sir. Uh, question. Uh, i got a situation. Uh, let's suppose one uh, has a wife, and uh, uh, this woman, uh, for years and years, keeps going uh, away from, uh, you know, from her husband and uh, does stuff that's not necessary into the marriage. And uh, no conversation, no any other way of uh, con you know conviction uh, is 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 helpful. And uh, one is uh, giving up. Uh, what would you uh, suggest? Well, in other words, there's, no, there's no patience anymore. Do I understand? Uh, if I, let's see if I understand you. Your wife has been uh, 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 troublesome, troublesome, troublesome for a long, long time, and now your patience or her patience is wa has worn so thin that you really want to, you or she wants a divorce. Is that your question? Well, um, actually, uh, I am myself. Yeah. Well, the fact is, uh, uh, the Bible says, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The Bible says the wife is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. And if so if she is shackled to you, you are shackled to her. And so uh, divorce should not be in your thinking if you're a child of God. Now, if you are not a child of God, then finally you're going to take matters into your own hand and you're going to say, I've had it, I've had it, I'm, I gotta, I'm going to go ahead with this and I'm going to divorce my wife. I, I can't stand it any longer. It's only if you're a child of God that you can say, Oh, Lord, have mercy for me. have mercy and forgive me that I would think about divorce. I know this has been impossible. But at the same time, let me ask another question. How often do you read Ephesians chapter 5? 
Now you're wondering why do I say that? And maybe you don't even, maybe you've never read Ephesians chapter 5. But I'm a husband. I've been a husband for a long, long time. And I'll tell you, this chapter has meant a whole lot to me. It says here in Ephesians 5 verse 25, and I can address every husband with this verse. Ephesians 5 verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now that is a big statement because the church that Christ is talking about is the eternal church, not the local congregation, but the eternal church that is made up of all those who do become believers. But how did he begin to love us? Because we were fine people? Because we loved him? Because uh, he was proud of us? No way. When he began to bestow his love upon any one of us, in, in God's eyes, we were despicable sinners. We were in rebellion against God. We were in opposition to Christ. Yet in his love, he laid down his life. He gave his life. He emptied himself of his glory and, and, and uh, paid an enormous price that we might be his, his uh, uh, bride. And, and that is the example that Christ is giving us. Now, here, I have a wife. She is a, a pain to me. Uh, perhaps you're saying she's a pain. She doesn't love me. She's this, she's that, the other thing. Let me ask the question. How about my love for my wife? Have I been an example uh, that is, uh, or has Christ been my example? Have I loved my wife? Uh, always wanting the best for her? Or is it possible that as a husband I have always been thinking of me first? What is good for me? Uh, what is my wife going to do for me? I am number one after all. I'm the head of this house, am I not? And she is uh, supposed to obey me and so on and so on. And that's the way we husbands think a whole lot. And that goes nowhere. That is going to, uh, what can we expect from our wife except that, uh, except for the grace of God, they're not going to like us. Of, uh, they're going to get tired of us more and more. And so the beginning point uh, is, first of all, there's two issues. Number one, divorce, no, never, never. Number two, I'm not going to look at my wife anymore uh, about uh, all her shortcomings. I'm going to look at me. What about my shortcomings in our marriage? And uh, how about me beginning to make a whole lot of correction? Because there's not one of us, if we look in the mirror, and if we're having uh, marital problems that we know, that we cannot make a lot of corrections in our own life without even asking our wife for any kind of correction. So would you think that this... This whole thing is uh, is a big test. Well, I, I I don't know what your situation is. All I know is these are the rules that God gives. That God, God, uh, uh, first of all, there cannot be divorce. Okay, I, I I don't want to talk about that anymore. I know there can't be divorce. Number two, uh, I I can't get my wife straightened out. She has to live her life with the Lord. And so I'm going to stop that, uh, trying to get her corrected. But I do know I've got to look at the mirror in myself. Am, how am I doing? Am I doing it God's way? And God has given me the, the marching orders. He's given me the direction here in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And that's what I'm going to go to work on now. I'm going to go to work on me, not on my wife. I'm going to go to work on me as I, so that I will more and more properly relate to my wife. And if that helps the marriage situation, fine. If it, if it doesn't help the marriage situation, uh, then I, I'm still not going to think of divorce because God commands us me not to do, not to think of that. And so 
But I can tell you that, you know, marriages are consist of two people trying to live together, and if one will really do it God's way, as, as the husband uh, is the one that ought to show the way, if they'll really do it God's way, I'll tell you, it's bound to have a profound effect on that marriage. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, good evening, Brother Camping. Yes. I'm Brother Eddie in Buffalo, New York. Yes. Um, my question is on Philippians 4 and 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, yes, where it talks about uh, uh, don't be anxious about anything but with prayer and supplications. Uh, you know that in the King James Bible, incidentally, it says don't be careful about anything, but that, is a, that word careful is an old English word for anxious. Don't be anxious about anything. Um, my Bible says don't be careful, and I'd like to give you um, this interpretation. Um, we shouldn't care about anything except pleasing the Lord. Now, is that correct or incorrect? No, it's the word careful is an old English word that is, uh, in this context and as it's used in the Bible, is a word that identifies with anxiety. And, you know, we, we uh, uh, as we live out our life, we get anxious a thousand times a uh, uh, a day sometimes in other words we're anxious about this we're anxious about that we're anxious about the other thing and the wonderful thing is that uh, we don't have to carry it alone we can go to the Lord and tell him all about our anxieties and and uh, but God gives us instruction that right? we can we supplicate that is we're beseeching the Lord we're begging the Lord and we are thanking the Lord God it makes wants to make sure that in our anxiety we don't forget all the good things for which we can be thankful for. Now hold on for just a moment. We have to pause for this message. We're continuing with the open forum. Do we still have a caller on the line? Yes, we do. Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, we were discussing uh, Philippians 4 and 6. Yes. And what I was concerned about was that um, perhaps we shouldn't be uh, giving our our feelings, thoughts, and times to um, worrying about um, in terms of be careful for nothing. But I thought that it meant that we should care for the Lord. And well, but you see, uh, well, let's let's carry this to its logical conclusion. Be careful for nothing. Well, now. For example, I may be deeply concerned about my walk with the Lord. Am I to be careful about that? Of course. I might be deeply concerned about my relationship with my wife. I, can I be, should I be careful about that? Of course. I, in other words, there, there are many things that are very serious in, the, in life that I should be careful about. and. But I, uh, but I, uh, now let me turn it around. I, uh, I, may, I may be anxious about my relationship with my wife. What can I do? I can tell the Lord all about it. And I can uh, 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 ask the Lord to strengthen me and, uh, and, and the Lord to guide me. And, and I can ask the Lord, oh Lord, will you work in me to will and to do of your good pleasure? And at the same time, I can thank him and, oh, Lord, I thank you for my dear wife. I thank you for my home. I thank you for the years that we've had together. I thank you that I can call upon you in prayer. I thank you for this wonderful promise of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and so on and so on. Okay, Brother Camping, um, I'll call you back in February. Thank you I for calling and, God, Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping? Yes. Uh, I was wondering if uh, you can tell me, uh, I'm trying to find it in the Bible, and I only have the one concordance, uh, where the verse is, 
in what book where it says, and we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he really is? Yes, that's First John. Look in First John. That's in the way back right before Revelation. Uh -huh. And uh, and uh, First John chapter 3, verse 2. First John chapter 3, verse 2, beloved. Now are we the sons of God, and then doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Most remarkable verse, a verse that is, is astounding to us as we ponder it, uh, that, uh, that God uh, will condescend or that, we, uh, that God uh, glorifies us in that way. It's, uh, it's beyond our imagination. Yeah, I guess. I guess it is, <laughs> because uh, I wanted you to elaborate on that a little bit. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Um, I just want to ask you a question about the story of Noah. You had eight people saved on the ark. Didn't Satan lose control of the world temporarily? There's no evidence of that of, of any kind. The Satan, there's just no, God doesn't enter into that. As a matter of fact, he did not because we find that uh, it's, uh, in fact, uh, there's language in, in Genesis chapter 6 that shows that no, Satan did not, uh, although it's by impl implication, it's not direct. But we read in uh, in uh, it's talking there about there were giants and the word giants is nephilim and and when we study that out it's not talking about some kind of a physical giant it's, it's talking about someone it's it, the word nephilim is a is a hebrew word that means those who will fall those who are are subject to falling into sin and uh, and in this case uh, the, uh, it is emphasizing that the men of renown, that is the men of the name, is actually uh, the way that should be translated. That is, there were those who were theologians, those who were great men of God, apparently, but they had fallen. They had fallen. But then, then God, uh, when we read this verse very carefully, it's very curious how God puts that. There were... Nephilim, or those who have fallen in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in under the daughters of men. That is, that in, there's an, an indication here that this kind of spiritual falling would continue after the flood. It did not mean for a moment that now God has cleansed the earth of the wickedness there he's starting all over with eight people uh, who are believers, and therefore we won't see sin, or if we do, it's going to be a long, long time away. No, God is indicating that the heart of man is still sinful. That is, there's still uh, the potential for sin, and, and that's going to go right on through into the world after the flood, which it did because uh, by the time we get go down a couple of thousand years down the way our god talks in Revel in genesis 11 about the tower of babel and how wicked the world had become then again and it's uh, and uh, uh, finally uh, uh, 3000 years after the flood or 4000 years after the flood well, let me see no 3000 years after the flood he has to start all over again with a little family in Ur of the Chaldees in Babylon, a family uh, uh, the husband was Abram, the wife was Sarah, and they had a nephew Lot, and that uh, the, those are the only uh, who were, together with a few individuals named in Abram's uh, 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 family line uh, there are no other believers that are named. So sin goes right on through the flood. That means Satan is still operating, and just as he, there's no indication of any change in Satan's fortunes because of the flood. 
Uh, what does this see in the waves roaring in, uh, I think it's in Luke? Uh, what is that figurative of? Uh, uh, in Luke, when it says what? When it says about man's heart failing them, and the sea and the waves roaring, what is the sea and the waves well, for, uh, roaring? What is that I, figurative of? I, I don't know. I, uh, I, I, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. I've read that, uh, I've read that verse a number of times, and it, it, it is. Uh, uh, it could be understood spiritually, the sea and the waves roaring. You know, the sea uh, has to do, in one sense, spiritually with hell itself. That hell is, go is making its demand on the unsaved of the world, and namely that it's almost time for Judgment Day. Uh, I don't, but I don't, I'm not qualified at this point to, uh, to speak very, uh, very, uh, uh, much about this verse, I, I don't feel I understand it well enough. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Oh, good evening, Mr. Kansas. Let me turn my radio off. Yes, and how are you tonight, sir? Oh, I'm very well, thank you. Yeah, I would like to ask a question. Uh, I have a friend who is like, you know, a young man, does, never got married, but has a daughter. And the relationship with, the, with his daughter's mother and him are not, well, I guess there's no relationship, it's just for the child. And then I wanted to ask you, what, what do you think the Bible talks about? relationships like this where you know there was a union and there's a child and then they're apart well are you you see the Bible uh, speaks again and again about sin and sin is a transgression of the law of God and God has given us laws uh, that uh, of every kind, uh, murdering is sin, stealing is sin, adultery is sin, fornication is sin, uh, 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 sexual perversion is sin, uh, uh, lies are sin, uh, anything that is not to the glory of God uh, is sin. And so sin is everywhere. Everywhere we turn, we see sin. And the consequence of sin is all the same, uh, the wrath of God. And that's why mankind so desperately has to find Christ as Savior, because he is the only antidote. He is the only one who is available to take the penalty for those sins, uh, on, take them on behalf of the sinner, so that that sinner won't be faced with the wrath of God. And that's what salvation is all about. So whether someone has been living in a, in a terrible relationship with his family members, or whether it is a, a sin that is affecting uh, those outside of the family, or whatever, it is all sin, dirty, rotten, miserable sin. Of course, the wonderful thing is that Christ came for sinners. And so regardless of how deep in sin we might be, if we become a child of God, every one of those dirty, rotten, miserable sins would have been covered by the blood of Christ, and uh, there will be no punishment for any one of them. But, but it's conditioned upon the fact that we have become a child of God, and that's an action that God has to take. Uh, that is, uh, we become a child of God when God uh, decides to save us. Oh, a relationship that was never taken to law and to be considered a marriage where a child is produced, just a relationship of sin, is that what you're saying? It's all sin, all sin. There's nothing, uh, and, and uh, in this life there are rules the, uh, that, that have to be followed insofar as the government establishes certain rules for situations, but, uh, but the penalty is uh, every human being 
even though in this life he may even appear to have been a very a very decent moral person a very righteous person if Christ has not become his savior he too is going to be standing at the judgment throne to answer for his sins and as I we read a little earlier from James chapter 2 verse 10 if we even com have committed one tiny little sin at the demand of the law of God or the penalty that the law of God specifies is eternal damnation and so nobody can uh, can uh, get right with God or escape hell unless the Lord Jesus has become their savior and that's what the whole business of the Bible is about to tell us about our sins and to tell us that there is uh, this way of escape through the Lord Jesus and to tell us that we have to wait upon God for that and and uh, get our encouragement from the Word of God in the meanwhile and I have another question if if I may Mr. Camping yes. um, you know this business about uh, fellowshipping on Sunday I fellowship by myself on Sunday because I was a person that was always used to loving my own company and, and loving to just be with God. But I'm wondering, if, if, if somebody calls me, uh, whatever their problem might be, am I obligated to answer the phone and, you know, and respond to other people? on a Sunday who are not really true believers, but they might need to call me for anything? Well, it, uh, it, uh, I can't answer that question. You may not feel qualified to answer the phone. Uh, you don't want to counsel, try, uh, be in the role of a counselor unless you really feel that you have some ability to do that. Uh, and it depends on who the caller is. And it, uh, uh, one thing, of course, you want to make sure about and that is uh, I yes I'm deeply concerned about my relationship with God but I am my brother's keeper I do have uh, I must love my neighbor as I love myself that is I want the highest good for my neighbor and therefore when somebody calls I want to uh, maybe at least to try to give them a tiny bit of encouragement but uh, everyone has to answer that for themselves. You may be, for example, uh, on the Lord's Day, which is the day particularly when we should be concerned about sending out the gospel, uh, you may already have been working at this as you have been passing out tracts or if you've been writing letters to friends to encourage them in the Lord or as you have uh, uh, visited uh, uh, someone who has been ill or a friend who is lonely or whatever and uh, so you uh, each one has to make their own judgment about that but we do know this as a as a fundamental principle we are our brother's keeper we're not saved just for me we are saved in order that we might serve Christ and and to serve Christ means we should have our concern for the salvation of others. Mr. Camping, I would like to thank you so very much for your very dedicated work uh, of the Lord. And I know that God himself has to have given you that heart. And I really appreciate it. I have learned so much from you, Mr. Camping. And please keep up this wonderful work of God. Thank you for thank calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Brother Camping. Uh, I don't know exactly how it was written, but if you might get the thought uh, and tell me what chapter. Uh, it says uh, how we should we uh, act on, you know, like bad people, around bad people, like that you should be wise as a fox and gentle as a lamb. Wise as a serpent? Are you talking, uh, uh, what was the verse you're looking for? Uh, I, was, I was looking for, uh, the, I've read it a long time ago, and I, for some reason, I have to read the whole Bible again to find it, because I don't remember. Excuse me, what was the first part of that verse? Uh, 
the thought is like you you should be wise as a fox but gentle as a lamb i don't think that's in the bible there is a verse that says that you are to be wise as serpents okay. but harmless as a dove wise as serpents but harmless as a dove i think that is uh, that's the same idea now uh, incidentally that serpent uh, a lot of times we think well uh, the serpent represents satan but in that context the serpent is like the serpent that was put on the pole that we read about in John 3 and it's really be, we are to be wise as God is wise as God and the only way we can be as wise as God is, is by reading the Bible to get our wisdom from him because the serpent represents God as the judge and and harmless as a dove the dove represents the Holy Spirit and and he comes as the dove of peace or the Holy Spirit brings peace uh, to those who have uh, uh, who are reconciled to God and so it's really a statement that we are to focus our whole desire on God himself but now where that verse is found wise as serpents but harmless as doves just offhand I can't put my finger on it maybe someone will be calling in with it very much thank but you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Um, I was just calling to find out what exactly is the kingdom of God mentioned in the New Testament. The kingdom I'll take my of, call off the air. Well, that's a very good question. The kingdom of God consists of every true believer, everyone who has become saved. The king who rules over the kingdom of God is Christ himself. Now it's called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the kingdom ruled over by Christ who is eternal God and it consists of every true believer who receive eternal life and we are forever uh, uh, with Christ in that kingdom thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yeah how you doing brother Camby? very well thank you um you know the 144,000 spoken of in revelations yes revelation chapter 7 yeah or and revelation chapter 14 are, are they all, all the only one? Is that the amount of people that were saved during the church age? No. Well, that is a, a symbolical number. It is not an actual number. God very frequently uses numbers to illustrate spiritual truth. Uh, for example, God uses the number 1,000 as a synonym for complete. God's love is for a thousand generation uh, uh, that is for a complete generation the whole generation of the true believers and here it is that uh, that uh, there's a hundred and forty four now hundred and forty four is twelve times twelve and the number twelve is frequently uh, symbolizing fullness and so it is for it is the number one hundred and forty four thousand is a statement that says that includes the complete fullness of all that would become saved throughout the church age and of course it's a number vastly greater than a literal 144,000 okay and um Hebrews 13 4 it talks about marriages um, un that the marriage bed be undefiled yeah marriage is honorable and the bed undefiled yes um wouldn't to all the people that are talking, calling in about divorce and stuff, don't you think God would, if you all go back to when you were young, don't you think God would want us not to be unequally? I mean, would want us to be <clears throat> with each other that are, you know, we're both Christians, we're unequally yoked, and wouldn't it be better that we were both virgins to each other? Well, now you must remember that the when you're married, then the sexual relationship is proper. That is, uh, the, the marriage bed 
in that sense is undefiled. Now it depends on if there are things going on that are just out of the uh, out of uh, the uh, chapter of pornography that uh, that is so uh, readily available in our day. Yeah, then it's not. Then it can be. Uh, it can be just a bed of lust and of evil desire. But uh, two people, one a true believer, another a not a true believer, still can have a a reasonably proper marriage bed. Uh, it's uh, but it becomes defiled the moment, particularly the moment that there is someone else in that bed other than the husband or the wife. So, so you're saying if one of them wasn't a virgin before the marriage, then it. As when they become married, it's it's not it's um, pure then. Well, no. What happened before they were married? That sin is uh, is uh, that's a, that's that sin. That's another sin that has to be paid for. But once two people become married, let's say that a person was a harlot uh, and a, a prostitute, and uh, and uh, then that person becomes married. Now that. Uh, all the sin of prostitution that has gone before that person that that has that person has to answer for that, but that doesn't mean now that in the marriage uh, this person can be a proper wife and uh, the marriage bed can be undefiled. Just the fact that she is has been a prostitute that doesn't mean that now that that marriage bed is defiled because she had been a prostitute. Can I ask you one more question? Yes. Um, in Leviticus 21, it talks about the penalties for sin. Um, can you know? You know, they shall surely be put to death. Um, do they? Can we still be forgiven for those sins? Well, but see, the penalty for each and every sin is the second death, eternal damnation. But the uh, well, Christ came for sinners, dirty, rotten sinners who have committed sin after sin after sin, and and uh, once Christ and when we become saved, it means that Christ has taken every one of those dirty, rotten sins and placed it upon Himself, and and, and laden with those sins. Uh, he stood before the judgment throne of God and was found guilty because those are very real sins and sentence was passed and he actually endured the wrath of God as payment for those sins in an equivalent fashion to that person spending an eternity in hell and only because he has made that payment therefore now God can forgive that those sins in the life of the one that has committed the sin, and that okay. is that that's pretty well what the whole message of salvation is all about. Okay, thank you very much, Brother Camping. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mrs. Camping. The lady called in about the scripture of, about harmless as the dove. Yeah. That's in Matthew ten. 16. Matthew 10, 60. Thank you very much. I'm going to read it a moment so, so that we lock it in. Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. There we read, uh, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. In other words, be a reflection of of God himself and pray for the wisdom of God oh my never never do we want to trust our own wisdom because no matter how smart we are how astute or wise we think we are forget it forget it we we our wisdom isn't worth anything compared with the wisdom of Christ and it's so wonderful as we live out our life, that again and again we can beseech the Lord, Oh, Lord, uh, I don't trust me at all. Please, please, will you uh, uh, give me wisdom? Will you guide me so that I will do it your way? And my, my, what a comfort that is to know that I'm in his hand and in his care. But shall we go to our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. 
Hi, Mr. Camping. How are you tonight? Very well, thank you. My, I have two questions. One is in Romans. Um, I noticed that all over in Romans it talks about the law, and it says the law of my members a lot. What does that mean? The law. Okay, now we're, we're, uh, I'm going to get into that in just a moment, but will you hold on because we're going to pause uh, for, a, uh, for a message. Uh, and I, I might just begin to tell you that the uh, Book of Romans has a lot to say about the law, but just hold on a moment. We have a caller on the line who is asking about the law of God. And that's a very, very important question. Uh, not only does the book of Romans talk about the law of God, but the whole Bible does. Incidentally, sometime read uh, Psalm 119. It's got 174 verses, I believe. And, and uh, there it uses synonyms for law like testimony, commandments, uh, uh, judgments, uh, uh, statutes. Uh, precepts, these are all synonyms for the law of God. What is the law of God? The law of God is the Bible. Now, here we read in Romans chapter 2, verse 14, For when the Gentiles, that is, those who were know nothing about the Bible, the context would indicate this, the, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, they have never read the Bible, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. In other words, the uh, mankind was created in the image of God. Intuitively, he knows there is a God. He knows that there are certain laws that he must obey even though God has never uh, verbalized them or articulated them to him or given them to him in the Bible because he's never read the Bible. Yet intuitively, he knows it's wrong to murder. He knows it's wrong to steal. He knows it's wrong to uh, commit adultery and so on. But the, but the Bible spells it all out. And so the whole Bible is the law of God. And any part of the law of God that we violate, any law that we break, and of course, uh, we break the law of God every single day uh, uh, if we examine our lives carefully. Even after we're saved, we find that that uh, any time we're not doing it to the glory of God, we're breaking the law of God. And so, and the, and the penalty for breaking the law of God is horrible. It's eternal damnation because the, the breaking of the law of God is an act of rebellion against God. And that's why it's so marvelous when we find Jesus to be our Savior because then we know that all that penalty has been taken by Christ on our behalf. Okay. Um, I have another question. Yes. Um, earlier, uh, you spoke, uh, you said the verse about husbands love your wives as yes. Christ loved the church. And um, what verse would you refer wives to? Well, the, the uh, Ephesians chapter five also speaks to the wives. Let's uh, let's let's read that. He, and I'm glad that you asked that because, of course, God is not just picking on the husbands. But we read in, in uh, uh, verse 22 of Ephesians 5, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, in other words, even as a child of God, we want to be obedient to Christ. And, of course, Christ never asks us to do anything sinful, but by the same token, as a wife, we want to be obedient to our husband in all things lawful. Now, here's the, here's the situation. Here's a husband who's married to an unsaved wife who doesn't want to be submissive to him. Is he to love her as Christ loved the church? The answer is yes. Yes, he is to want the very best for her. All right, let's turn the situation around. Here is a wife 
who dearly loves the Lord, but her husband is a renegade. He's a brutal individual and makes all kinds of demands on her that are uh, that are not fair. They're not. Uh, uh, they're not uh, nice at all. Uh, is she to be submissive? Well, as, as long as he doesn't ask her to do something sinful. Now, if she, if he asks, if he treats her badly uh, and and is rough with her, uh, she has to take that very patiently. You know, in uh, in First Peter chapter uh, chapter three. God speaks to that issue of the of the wife. Uh, uh, in in if you read First Peter chapter two, there God talks about a servant or a slave that has a master that he can't come out from under, and uh, and that master treats that slave very very badly, and uh, and uh, uh, God uh, says this in verse nineteen of First Peter two. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. In other words, as that slave is is badly treated, uh, he is suffering wrongfully, and yet he takes it patiently. That is to uh, that is the way a child of God is to act, because it goes on in verse 20. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted, that is punished for your faults? Ye shall take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. That is, when we are are uh, maligned and slandered and beaten or whatever might happen, and we patiently taking it, forgiving and forgiving and forgiving, now we are living a life pleasing unto God. And then God go, and God gives Christ as an example, as a matter of fact. He says in verse 21 of 1 Peter 2, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, remember, he was perfect when we're reviled, uh, by someone, well, sometimes there's an, at least an element of, of truth in the reviling, and uh, so we better be, we we don't we better take it patiently. But Christ was perfect, and when he was reviled, if anybody could object, he could. But what does it say? When he was reviled, he reviled and not again. Then, as God goes on with the message. He goes right on into chapter 3. Likewise, likewise, that is in like manner to what I'm talking about, the relationship of a slave to his master. Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands. And, uh, and uh, in verse 3, who's adorning, let it not be that outward of the plating of hair and the wearing of gold, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible. In other words, as you are have a beast of a husband and you patiently endure and you patiently pray for him, uh, desiring the very best for him, recognizing that God has put him there as a testing program for your own life, uh, then the fragrance of Christ will shine through and it can even uh, be uh, something God can use to to uh, help open the eyes of this of this husband who has been treating you so badly. Thank you, Brother Kathy. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Brother Camping. How are you? Very well, thank you. Brother Camping, a quick question. I'm hoping you can tell me why uh, in Psalm 24, verse 6, uh, David, speaking under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, called God, uh, O Jacob. Uh, you Psalm remember? 24. Yeah. Verse, verse six. 6. This is the generation of that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob, Selah. Well, you see, God was typified by various individuals. He was typified by David. 
uh, uh, the word David means uh, means uh, beloved, and and in certain places God actually or Christ is spoken of with the name Jacob. We find that particularly, for example, in Ezekiel. Thir- or excuse me, with the name David, we find that particularly in Ezekiel chapter 37. Uh, he is typified by. Uh, Mm, by uh, Abraham. Abraham uh, was the uh, uh, God is uh, or, or all those who are the seed of or, or the true believers are of the seed of Abraham. So Abraham was another name for God. And here God is using Jacob uh, uh, because Jacob was one of the patriarchs. That's one of the reasons just like Abraham was. But also the word Jacob means supplanter, supplanter. And you see, uh, Jacob supplanted Isaac and when he got the birthright. But we also know that Christ supplanted uh, uh, Satan when he took the kingdom away from, that is the true believers, away from uh, uh, Satan and made them his children. And I think that's one of the reasons he is called Jacob here. Oh, that makes very good sense. Thank you very much. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. The number to call, incidentally, is 1-800-322-5383. Five three eight five. Brother Hill Capping? Yes, go ahead with your Okay, call. I just had two questions. It's it's an honor to talk to you by the way. I'm really uh, kinda nervous. Um I have a question in Matthew five nineteen. Matthew five nineteen, let's look at that. Matthew five nineteen. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, what are you what are you thinking about? Okay, my question is: um, I normally associated the kingdom of heaven being with uh, with true believers. Yes. And why would someone be teaching a commandment and be called least in the kingdom of heaven in this verse? That's, that's a very good question. You know, the fact is we have to look at some other scriptures in order to figure this out. The Bible says, for example, that uh, that uh, uh, Jesus is spoken of as least in the kingdom of heaven. Now, why would he be least? Because he became sin for us. He came under the wrath of God. And and in the, and so those who are teaching wrong uh, doctrines, that is, who are peddling their own kind of a gospel, they are li- like Jesus in the sense that they are under the wrath of God. They are still subject to damnation. I believe that's the way we have to look at that. Oh, amen, amen. And the next one is also in Matthew, and it's uh, verse 10. Verse 10, yeah, if, uh, Matthew 5, verse 10. Oh, no, actually, it's going to be Matthew 8, verse 10. Uh, Matthew 8, verse 10. Let's look at that. Matthew 8, verse 10. There we read, when Jesus heard it, uh, oh, okay, well, he has, uh, he's talking to, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Roman in- individual, uh, uh, who uh, had a, uh, a centurion who had a servant that was very sick and Jesus was going to come to see him and then the servant, this uh, centurion simply says, no, you don't have to, uh, you're able to uh, to speak and, uh, and heal my servant. In other words, he had an implicit trust in, in what the Lord, who the Lord Jesus was. And then in verse uh, uh, 10, uh, Jesus said, uh, when Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I fa- say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. Now, you see, uh, here, 
God is indicating that kingdom of heaven is is uh, uh, there's an external expression of the kingdom of heaven, and that's uh, identifies again with the other verse shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. It is it is anyone who is a member of the church during the church age, or who was of the nation of Israel during the. Uh, the uh, time when Israel was the centerpiece of God's salvation plan, that 1,500 years from the time Israel went out of Egypt until Christ came, uh, they were externally identified with the kingdom of God. And, uh, and, uh, and anyone who was not of national Israel at that time was outside. They were a, a, a Gentile dog. They were unclean uh, all together. Now, here is this Roman centurion who is a Gentile. He's not of the nation of Israel. He is not externally represented by the kingdom. Uh, 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 he's not externally a part, or he's not a part of the external representation of the kingdom of God, which was national Israel. And yet he has a deep trust. He's manifesting a deep trust. Christ is God, and He uh, He uh, can do what He uh, whatever He wishes to do. He He has placed His trust in Christ, and so Christ is using that as an illustration that the fact that even in that day the eternal kingdom of God, those who would be forever with Christ, are not confined in any sense just to the nation of Israel. But there were Gentiles like this Roman centurion who were looked upon like he as if they were heathen dogs who were actually true believers who were eternally citizens of the kingdom of God whereas a great many people and it was a vast number of people of those of national Israel who were externally identified with the kingdom of God or, or identified with the external representation of the kingdom of God which was the nation of Israel and yet who are going to end up in hell and uh, and uh, so in other words uh, the fact is for example if so someone can be the finest church member in the world which throughout the church age was an external representation of the kingdom of God but if they had not become saved, they're still completely under the wrath of God. And can I ask one more question, Brother Hill Camping? Yes. Okay, uh, the last one is also in Matthew, and it's uh, chapter 18, and it's verse 10. Uh, what Ma it says is... Matthew 18, verse 10. Yes, sir. There we read, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones, for I say unto you that in heaven there are angels... You always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. You see, the little ones that God is speaking about are the true believers. We are the children of God, and we, except we become as a little child, we cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. In other words, we come very humbly broken before God with no trust in our own strength whatsoever, and there God, and once we are saved, we have eternal protection. We are always under the care of God. Amen. Well, God bless you. Okay, Brother Hill, Captain, and have a good night, sir. Thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello. Yes. Uh, uh, Mr. Campy, yeah. uh, from wh what I get out of the Bible is... When I die, I will not be raised until Jesus Christ comes back. Is that true or false? If you, uh, when you die, uh, you're, that is true. That is true. All right. Now, with that in mind, you know, are you telling me that people that died 2,000 years ago are still waiting under the ground to be risen? Yes. That's true? Yes. Wow. Let me let me let me read to you uh, John chapter 5. Let me read to you John chapter 5. Let's hear what God has to say about that. We read in John 5 uh, uh, in verse 29 
uh, or verse 28, marvel not at this. This is John 5, verse 28. For, uh, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. So they that have done good under the resurrection of life, that is, they will be resurrected with a glorified spiritual body and caught up in the air to be reunited with their soul in which they've been living with Christ since they died. And then it goes on, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That is, they will stand for judgment and be found guilty and be damned to hell forevermore. Wow! Yeah, I just have—I know it's like you said, it's in the Bible there, but I, you know, I have a hard time accepting, you know, two thousand years late in the ground. You know, it well, that's, seems like such a long time. Well, that's—I know you're not—you're not conscious of nothing, and you know, I know that part of it, but well, you know, it seems like a waste there. Well, that's because uh, we're not God. God is God. And so the people who died in the flood of Noah's day 7,000 years ago are going to be resurrected to stand for judgment. The people who died in Sodom and Gomorrah when, the, when uh, they were destroyed by fire and brimstone are going to be resurrected and stand for judgment and so on. You, uh, you know, in fact, Jesus... Jesus spoke about that, uh, uh, the resurrection of, of, of those in Sodom and Gomorrath in, uh, in, I believe, in Matthew, or around Matthew 12, maybe. Let me see. Let me see. Let me see. In Matthew 12. We read in... Uh, Verse 23, Matthew 12, verse 23. But thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have continued until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. Now, uh, the only reason that it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom is that at least in the in the city of Sodom there were three who escaped or who were appeared to be true believers, namely Lot and his two daughters, whereas God is talking about Capernaum here uh, that he has been ministering to, and apparently there are there's no one becoming believers and so uh, but but the context is clearly showing that in the day of judgment the people of Sodom uh, as well as the people of Capernaum who died 2,000 years ago they will have to stand for judgment okay thank you Mr. Thank Campy I, I learned a lot thank you thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum hi brother Campy yes um, I wanted to ask um, if I wanted to um, get out of the church like um, you've been teaching, and I've been trying to, but um, my spouse and my in-laws and also my side of the family, um, they still want me, they still want us to go to church. How would I go about um, or how how should I react, or what should I tell him? I well, I this this is a very very difficult matter. It's parallel to a, to a common situation during the church age when when uh, one spouse uh, uh, really wanted to be a part of a local congregation, and the other spouse was not a believer and didn't want to be at all. And then now, uh, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, and uh, she. Uh, 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 it, it's just difficult. It takes a lot of patience, and uh, and one thing is is and so now it's the same problem exists where one spouse want, uh, insists, you know, you have to go to church, and the other one says, no, but I, I that's contrary to the law of God. I shouldn't go, and so 
Uh, there, to begin with, you want to be the best wife possible. You want to show your love to your husband and your obedience to your husband in everything. And then in a tender moment sometime you can talk to your husband and uh, he knows that you love him uh, and want to be obedient and, uh, and you've really shown this and you can say, you know, honey, honey, you got to remember when you're insisting I go to church with you on Sunday, I am in terrible, uh, my conscience is terribly bound, I'm in trouble because I feel like I'm disobeying God and, and please, uh, would, uh, would, uh, why don't you go and why don't, I, why don't you just let me stay at home? And, uh, and you, 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 it's just going to take a lot of patience uh, and, and uh, uh, eventually, uh, but <laughs> what I'm trying to get to is in this, whatever you do, even though you, you finally are going to come to a point where you say, no, honey, I cannot go. I cannot go. Even if you beat me, I cannot go. But in the meanwhile, you're going to love your husband to pieces. You're going to want to be as obedient in every other action. Uh, and uh, so that he can see uh, when you become very firm and, and you're ready to take a beating or whatever, whatever the, uh, his... Uh, his uh, uh, anger uh, is expressed against you because you want to do it God's way and that's 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 the way it's going to go now you also might get a co maybe you've already done this get a copy of the books the end of the church age and after and wheat and tares and uh, and you might uh, if you could possibly get your husband to read that with you that will help direct both of you into the word of God on this question Okay, uh, so so I should still be obedient, like the Bible said. To just well, you see, the, this is where where the where the t trouble lies, and that is, you you are to be obedient to your husband in all things lawful, but when your husband is asking you to do something that you feel is not lawful, then then you uh, have to obey God rather than your husband, and that's. That's why I say the time, uh, uh, you want to set the stage for this by showing uh, definitely that it isn't because you are in, in uh, rebellion against your husband in general. You really love him. You want to be obedient. But on this one matter, you're willing to take the consequences of disobedience because you want to serve God rather than man. So pray a lot for wisdom. Pray a lot for wisdom and and for patience in this and and for strength to do it God's way. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we're going to have to say good night because we've come to the end of our time. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night.